Greetings from Crossroads Church in Aransas Pass, Texas. You know, as humans, we have breath, life, willpower, emotions, good days, bad days, strengths, and yes, sometimes weaknesses. But no matter where you are in life, the highs and lows, or how much progress is being made, we encourage you to take some time with us in watching this next video. Take care. So we're, we're, we're starting a new series called Signs of the Times. I don't know about you guys, but I was, I was raised in church. Any other church brats here? Amen. How many of you were raised in church? Some of you, I don't know if it did you any good. But, well, yeah, it probably did. But uh, some of us are kind of sketchy, even though we spent time in church. Sometimes, sometimes attending church can be hazardous to your spiritual health. How many of you knew that? <laughs> well, here's the deal. Uh, churches, churches are led and full of flawed people. There's nobody, nobody perfect. The closest I ever saw was my mom, and uh, she's not with us. Uh, she's not with us anymore. And they said, well, "What about your dad?" Well, you know, opposites attract, so we have that. But no, I was I was blessed with great parents. I appreciate the fact that uh, you know I was ra- I was raised in church, and I've been in church most of my life. I'll be 38 this year, or so uh, those uh, <laughs> I have those numbers back. I think I'm 83. At least I felt 83 this morning. I tried to get out of bed, but. Um, when you're, raised, when you're raised in church like I was, we, we, uh, back a few decades ago especially, there was a lot of interest and in, in a lot of discussion, a lot of sermons and teaching on the end times. And we're talking about the, the signs of the times. We'll be covering this over the, uh, over the next few weeks as we, as we really begin to think about where we are. I, I don't know if, if you know this, but God has a plan. That's one thing I know. The first thing I know is that God has a plan. The second thing I know is a lot of times I don't understand his plan. That brings me to the third thing I know. A lot of times I want to doubt, number one, that he has a plan because I don't, number two, I don't understand what his plan is. So God doesn't always get to specifics in every area of our life. But what we see throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, God, uh, God does not always specifically give us all the information, but he gives us signs, signs along the way that show us where we are in his plan for the last days. Listen, I want to tell you guys something. It's getting crazy out there. The world, the world is getting crazy. And I am so thankful this morning. I mentioned my parents. When I get to heaven, I'm going to give them a big hug again and just thank him for the way that they raised me and I tried to raise my kids listen I did the very best I could with Victoria you can't blame me for everything people Victoria is the Christian I should be but you know we as parents we try to raise our kids and we and we want to be consistent that was the thing as a parent I wanted my kids to see me try you know they're they're my Victoria and other 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 my kids would get up and say oh my dad is like, I mean, he was the ultimate example of what a Christian should be. But I hope that they will say, hey, you know, dad's messed up, but at least he tried. Wasn't that funny, Latrice? That was from a place in my heart. <laughs> it was unburdening my heart. That's the reason why God called her to be a, a school teacher and not a therapist. Because you're sharing your heart with your therapist and they start laughing in your face. That is not good. But we love Latrice and thank her for her... Uh, you know, letting God use her in a great way in our church. But that's all, all I'm gonna, good I'm going to say about her right now. So I want to talk for a few moments this morning and, and over the next few Sundays. It will be a very interesting and very enlightening study for us so that you understand that God is not throwing all of this thing together. And so in life, it just seems like everything is so random. It seems like everything is spinning out of control. God raises kings and God causes kings to fall. God's still in control. And here's something else. I heard somebody say this, and I've heard a number of people say this, and I want to share this. There's a good place for it. I've gone to the last page of the book, and you know what, guys? We win. Ah, yeah, that's pretty good news right there. Winner, winner. No, it's Thanksgiving, turkey dinner. So you're not paying attention to the signs of the times. It's November. You can't say chicken dinner. Well, I guess you can. But, but there are signs all around us that indicate... Uh, that indicate to us where we are on, on God's clock or God's calendar. So uh, I want to begin reading this morning in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 1. And 
So Jesus had another conversation with the Pharisee and the Sadducee. So let me talk for 30 seconds about the, you know, like today we're in a very political time. Okay. And we always like, we're very, we've gotten very tribal. And so there's really two political ideologies. Let me test you here this morning. What's one political ideology that would describe the Democrats mainly? Starts with an L. Liberal, right? And the Republicans tend to be conservative. That, for whatever reason, that seems to be the way human nature sort of separates themselves. Well, in Jesus' day, it was the exact same thing. The Pharisees were the conservatives, and the Sadducees were very liberal. I don't even know what all those titles mean, but that would be if you were trying to like figure out. The, the Sadducees were generally... The Pharisees, rather, were generally not teachers. They were the ones that would be responsible for the local synagogues. So there was one temple in Jerusalem, but there was a number, just like we have a number of churches throughout. We don't have like one church. You know, we're not like Mormons where they have the one church and then they have other houses of worship. We have houses of worship. We don't have just one central one. But in Judaism, they had the temple and then they had the synagogues in each community, which was very much their houses of worship. And the Sadducees, well, they were, just, they were just a hot mess. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, it says this, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Don't, don't you think that's curious? Jesus had been opening blinded eyes. He had caused the deaf to hear. He caused the lame to walk. He fed 5,000 men, plus women and children, what was it? Five loaves of bread and two fish. Another time it was 4,000. I mean, he was raising people from the dead. And so here's what the religious leaders say. Oh, but if you'll do a sign, we'll believe in you. Here's the mistake that a lot of people make. God's not going to jump through hoops to try to get you to believe in him. And I, I, I love to watch po podcasts. I love to watch podcasts or, or people that have a different point of view than I do like atheists and sometimes scientists, and they mock and they ridicule the fact of a God because it's almost as they're suggesting, because I don't understand God, therefore he cannot exist. I want to tell you something. God's not going to jump through hoops to try to convince you that he exists. I mean, he is the creator of heaven and earth. And this, this universe, which is just, I mean, it's just expanding. It's mind-blowing how massive it is. And I understand. So either way you take it, it's a leap of faith. Either this thing happened by accident, there was just a random explosion, and this matter formed into the universe as we know it. But here's the question, where did the matter come from? There's no process whereby you can create something from nothing. So that's a leap of faith. Or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, make up your mind, people. I don't know what to tell you. But that, okay, thank you, Jim. I like Jim more than I do Latrice. So, uh, <laughs> so, so the, the religious leader said, hey, all, all we need to do is you just give us a sign. All these signs he was giving him. So the problem is not God has to reveal himself to us. The problem is our heart. There's an old expression that says this. There's no one more blind than he who refuses to see. So the, the Pharisees and Sadducees say, hey, give us a Give us a sign. And Jesus answered them and said, when it is evening, this was his response. When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and it is. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. So they, they knew by the formation of the clouds, the color of the sky, they knew what the weather was going to be. And Jesus was frustrated with them and said, how is it that you can discern the weather, but you cannot see the signs of the times. And so living in what we would consider ourselves in the last days, and biblically and theologically, we can prove that. Because in Acts chapter 2, Peter was saying in the last days, he read Joel chapter 2, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon a flesh. And, and that's what Peter said. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So we, that was the beginning of the last days. Now the last days has gone on a lot longer than probably any of us, and probably any of the New Testament writers would have ever imagined. You say, why, why hasn't Jesus come back? Well, Peter writes about that, and he says the reason why he hasn't come back is because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge. So he waits and he tarries. I, hey, I'm ready for him to come back now. 
we, pastors always talk about, boy, we'd love to see our churches full. You know when we're going to see our churches full? About two hours after the rapture, you're going to start seeing a lot of churches full. It's like, ooh, you know, in Gulf, when we hit a bad shot, we call a mulligan so we can hit another one. But when that event takes place, you can't call a mulligan. I mean, it's, you know, God's plan is already set. Am I scaring you guys a little bit? Good. I'm trying to scare you into heaven. No, I'm just kidding. So in Matthew 24, verse 3, uh, Jesus said this in response to, or his disciples asked him a question in response to a statement that Jesus made about the temple being destroyed. Matthew 24, verse 3 says this, And he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? King James Version says end of the world, but a better translation is the end of the age. An age is a period of time, and God has different ages, different dispensations. Like the Old Testament was, was God dealing with the nation of Israel, the New Testament, and towards the end of the age. This is what, this is what the, the prophet Daniel referred to. We're living in the time of the Gentiles. You know what a Gentile is? Someone that's not Jewish, a non-Jewish person. So in the Bible, there's two classifications of people, the God's chosen people, the Jews in the Old Testament, and then the Gentiles, which are the non, do we have any Jewish people here? If you do, we love you and God bless you. Have any Gentiles here? 100%. Come on, people. If you didn't raise your hand for the Jews, how many Christians we have here? Oh, I lost half of you right there. Uh, How many, how many heathens do we have here? Oh, wow. Well, same ones that raise their hand. Okay, well, you got that battle going on. Just, just hang in there. So in theology, the study of the last days, there's a term called eschatology. That's a theological, theological term, which means the study of the last days or the end times. It really means the study of the end. Or, but in Christian theology, it's the study of the end times. God, God started this thing, and there's an end to it, and God has sent us signs so that we can be ready for things that are going to happen. Uh, most of the things that the, the subject matter doctrines of eschatology are presented in the format of prophecy. The Bible is a, is a fascinating book. I, listen, if you want to absolutely change your life as a Christian, uh, how many of you taking notes this morning? Anybody taking notes? Uh, okay. How many of you are on your phone with a plan on an app while I'm talking? That's okay. At least you're here. So look, if you're, if you're taking notes and you want to absolutely change your life as a Christian, do this. Read your Bible. And you do what it says. That would be absolute. Would you be surprised how many Christians never pick up their Bible and never read it to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with them about making changes in their life? That's the beautiful thing about it. God didn't tell me to change myself. God didn't tell me to try go to to just go try to live my best life or uh, or or to just just uh, try to utilize self employment. What God has spoken to me in my word, or in his word rather, is that if I will allow him to come into my life, he will make the changes. He will change my desires. He will change my dreams. He will change my priorities. He will change my values. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So when you're struggling, it means you're trying to do too much for yourself. Yes, we have to discipline ourselves. Yes, we have to make good choices. But the best choice is, is what's the first thing we do? Pray first. We pray first in the morning, and then through every situation we face, we pray first, but then uh, right after you pray, if you can, spend a little bit of time in God's Word and let God's Word speak to you. So the Bible, the Bible starts off, the Bible starts off with a lot of history. You know, first five books, the, they call it the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. That's a lot of, uh, that, that's, that's the law, rather. That's a lot of the law. And then when you start getting into uh, Joshua and Judges and all that, then you get to a period of history. There's a lot of Old Testament history. It's a little bit Hard to read through sometimes. And you get through the history, and then, then you get to the prophets. You have major prophets like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel. And then you have what they call minor prophets. The major prophets are not major because they're more important, and the minor prophets are not minor because they're less important. It's just their books are really small. So you get to the end of the Old Testament, and you have like Obadiah, you have Zephaniah, you have Zechariah, you have Nahum, you have Jonah. You have Malachi, which is, I said, I think it's about 12 or 13 of them. I'm the pastor. I should know that, but quit judging me, okay? Because I had my grandkids spend the night the other night. My mind is just shot right now. But, but, but those books are still important, but they're called minor prophets because they're smaller books. So that whole end of the Old Testament is, is prophecy. Understand that most of the prophecy that we find in Scripture has already been fulfilled. Because most of it, a lot of it had to do with the first coming. And the part that's left that has not been fulfilled is about his second coming. 
Just as he came the first time as a babe in a manger, the next time he's coming, guys, he's not coming back as a baby in a manger to be crucified and spit upon and mocked and ridiculed and laughed at. The next time he's coming back, he's coming back crowned king of all kings and lord of lords, triumphant over death and the grave to set up his kingdom forever and forever and forever. And at that time, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I am glad I'm on the winning side this morning. So, that was not heartfelt. Don't even do that. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we talk about prophecy, and everybody wants to know the future. So a lot of Americans today that don't attend church, or some that probably do, they like to get up every morning and read their horoscopes. And horoscopes tend to be predictions that are very vague and generalized. You can read, and I don't know all the classification of the horoscope. I don't read it, but uh, I, I remember as a kid reading through it one time because we had the San Antonio. I grew up in San Antonio. Go Spurs! But I grew up in San Antonio. And, and I'd see, what, read the newspaper and I'd read the sports and the funnies. And one time I, I read the horoscope and I read all the different horoscopes and every single one applied to my life. It wasn't just like the one and I don't even know what my sign is. But uh, so if anybody ever comes up and asks you what your sign is, just say, loser, just do it like that. And they won't ask you again. So uh, the horoscopes tend to be very vague and generalized. But biblical prophecy is unparalleled in its accuracy and it's validated by historically biblical and secular sources. I would just mention, too, in case you're wondering, in case you're, well, you know, the Bible, that, how, can we, how can that be reliable? We don't even know if it's reliable, but, uh, but there were two secular, these were not people that believed in Jesus. These were not Christians. There were two secular historians in the first century that validate, and, and what little they wrote about Jesus absolutely validates the, the New Testament record. The first one I, we'll talk about here for just a moment is Josephus. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. The second was Tacitus, who was the most prestigious Roman historian of that first century. And both of them write of Jesus. And his book, Antiquities, found in book 20, chapter 9, there's only two references by Josephus about Jesus of Nazareth. But you know, for many years, there were scoffers and mockers that said, well, Jesus didn't really exist. It was, he was just a fable. But first century Jewish, not a believer in Jesus, Tacitus, not a believer in Jesus, but they both confirm the existence of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Antiquities found in book 20, chapter 9, mentions the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James. And Tacitus writes, we don't have a lot of his writings from the first century, much of it was destroyed, but there is a section that they do still have. Tacitus describes Nero blaming the Christians for the great fire in Rome, A.D. 64. I don't know whether, I really don't know whether Nero actually sat there and fiddled by Rome burnt, but we do know he did blame the Christians for the fire that he himself had burnt because he, uh, he was a little nuts. And this is what Tacitus wrote about the, that great fire. Therefore, to stop the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished in the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the, whom the crowd styled Christians. So you see Tacitus is not an admirer of Christians. Christus, which was the Latin term of Christ. The, fa- the, the founder of the name has gone under the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. That's also validated in the New Testament. By sense of the procurator Pontius Pilate and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment. So this Jesus, he was superstitious as considered by the Romans. Continuing only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, again, not a supporter, not a follower of Jesus. He he referred to Christianity as a disease, but in the capital itself were all things horrible and shameful in the world, collect and find a vote. So he was not promoting Christianity, but he was at least acknowledging that that his followers, that Jesus existed and his his followers uh, were uh, blamed and responsible at least according to Nero's account of the fire that was taking place. So um, let's talk a minute about some of the prophecies and how prophecy works. We, I talked about how that there were prophecies in the Old Testament that related to Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the difference between Christians and Jews is this. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is a Messiah. You know what the term Messiah means? It means the anointed one. Okay? Messiah is his Old Testament title. When you say Jesus Christ, Christ is not his name. Christ is his title. Christ coming from a Greek word and Messiah coming from a Hebrew word mean the exact same thing. Mean the anointed one, mean, mean, mean the chosen one of God, right? So Jesus is referred to as the Messiah in the Old Testament and Christ 
in the New Testament. And the difference between Christians and Jews is as Christians, we believe Jesus is God's Messiah. And uh, we as Christians... And I'll probably talk about this here in a few minutes, but we as Christians really value and admire and love the Jewish people for obvious reasons. But sometimes the feeling is not so mutual. Uh, there, are, there are other Christian traditions that I would be considered a heretic because I don't attend their church or I don't believe like they believe. I, you know, I mean, there are a lot of us, there are a lot of us that I don't do so well when I have authority uh, you know, to be told or, or to, to be enlightened uh, or for someone to help me is one thing, but to pass down rules and orders and you will conform to this, I don't do so well with that stuff. You know, nobody puts baby in a corner. You know what I'm saying? Some of you hadn't seen that movie in years and I just triggered something, didn't I? And so, and so there, there are believers, there are, other, there are other traditions that judge us because we don't belong. And we're, in fact, we can't even go to heaven. Look, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. Here's what I'm hanging all of my, my life now and all of eternity. I'm hanging it on the person of Jesus Christ. Not on a church. And a church cannot save me. Water baptism can't save me. I'm not hanging on any of that stuff. I am all in on Team Jesus. And if if He can't get me there, I'm not going to get there. I believe He's the way. I believe He's the truth. I believe He's the life. I believe He died on that cross. I believe He was raised on the third day, day triumphant over death on the grave. And He said, because I live, you shall live also. So I'm in all, I'm all in on Jesus. Now, I love churches. I'm thankful for every denomination. I'm thankful for every Christian. When No matter what church they go to or, or if they believe a little differently than I do. Listen, it's okay for people to disagree with me because it's all right for them to be wrong. No, seriously, though, the older I get, I approach a lot of this with more and more humility because I know, you know, there's some there's some churches that literally believe when they get to heaven, God's going to set them over there and point to the rest of them and say, these were the ones that were right. And that's the fantasy of every pastor, of every church, of every denomination. But when we get to heaven, every pastor, every church, every Christian is going to find out we were a little bit wrong somewhere. He's right. He's the one. And that's why, that's why we keep our, our eyes upon him. And I'm thankful for churches and, and the body of Christ. I love, I love all Christians, but uh, it's Jesus is the one. He's the one that makes a way. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew was the gospel that was written mainly to people of Jewish descent. You said, why was, there, why was there four different gospels? Well, there were four authors and they had four different audiences. And Matthew's audience was to those of Jewish descent. And so he points out, this was very important. When Jesus, when Jesus as a little boy and as a young man and as a Jewish rabbi, the Bible that Jesus had is what we refer to as the Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had. And so when Jesus taught, he taught out of the Old Testament. So when Matthew was trying to speak to a largely Jewish audience and trying to prove to them or authenticate the ministry, the life and the death of Jesus, he wanted to show them, he needed to show them prophecies from the Old Testament that, that Jesus fulfilled. And he does it beautifully. They don't even have to do a lot of research. Matthew chapter 2, uh, verse number 4 said this. And this is at the birth of Jesus. And assembling all the chief priests, this is talking about Herod, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, this is what the chief priests told Herod. They went, where is this new king going to be born? And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they went to the religious leaders. What about this Messiah? What about this king that's supposed to come? And they said, well, we can tell you. We can't tell you his name, but we can tell you he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, if you want to look that up in the Old Testament, it's Micah chapter 5, verse 2. They were quoting Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So they were telling Herod, listen, listen, that, that king is going to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the Old Testament tells us. So that's the reason why Herod sent soldiers and every child in Bethlehem, every child two years and older, every male child, he had them slaughtered. 
because he wanted to try. He was so threatened by an infant that could grow up to be a king, to be his rival. He tried to wipe out and destroy all those children. Matthew chapter 2, that same chapter, verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Here's what, here's what you guys need to understand. We're not talking about a white Jesus. We're not talking about a white Jesus. Jesus just doesn't belong to the white folks. I have to tell you this, Jesus was not a white guy. He would have looked, he would have hit, he would, he would have reflected the complexion and the skin color of that, of that first century Palestine. He started in the Middle East and he spent his, he spent his early years in Africa. Jesus belongs, belongs to people of all races. He's not just a white man's God. And I'm thankful this morning when John got to heaven and that, that, that book of Revelation, he said, he said, I saw people from every tribe, every kindred, every nation, every tongue. They were all around the throne of God. He saw people from every, every ethnicity and every race around the throne of God. Because we, no matter our differences, we're united by the love of God. And it's not the color of our skin. Racists are not very bright people. Racists are not very bright people. And I can prove that this morning. Because a racist is usually a person that's very fair complected. Okay? And they don't like people that have darker skin than they do. And then during the summer, these very fair skinned white people go to the beach and the pool to try to get darker skin. That tells you right there, we're not very smart if we're racist. Verse 14. God told Joseph, take, because Herod, to try to warn him, Herod was going to kill the children. So God told Joseph, take your family, go to Egypt to get out of the jurisdiction and out of the reach of Herod. Verse 14, Joseph rose, took the child with his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord spoken, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is out of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. Out of Egypt, I called my son. And you know, those Old Testament scholars, when they would read that, would think, that doesn't make any sense. Why would he be in Egypt? But God knew and God had a plan. Dropping down to verse 16 through 18 of that same, that same uh, chapter, Matthew 2. And then when Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region that were two years old and under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. Then was filled, then, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in, in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15 is the Old Testament prophecy. Didn't, didn't mention Herod by name, but mentioned how that the children, the children would be killed. In fulfillment of the prophecy, Herod trying to destroy. Amen. Well, that was my, uh, that was my introduction. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Boy, some of you, some of you are smiling, but it's a nervous, nervous smile right now, isn't it? Let me, let me wrap this up. So that was the main point I want to try to get across to you today, is that God does speak to us through prophecy as he did in the Old Testament. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about things that are happening today that would indicate to us that we're living in the last days. So I want to talk about one sign this morning as I prepare to close. So when a pastor says that, 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 means, that means nothing. I am preparing to close. Here's the sign. Keep your eye on the nation of Israel. Keep your eye on the nation of Israel. That's the most important sign in these last days. You say, why is that? Listen, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. And here's why Israel was God's chosen people. God met a man by the name, his name was Abram. I think we have a sign of, we have a picture of Abraham, don't we? No, not that Abraham, the other one. Give me that. Yes, that, that, that Abraham. We got jokes here. What can I say? Um, so there was, a, uh, there was a man by the name of Abram who came from a city called Ur of the Chaldeans, which we know now as Iraq. He was raised in a family. There were idol worshipers. He did not know the God of, of the Jews. Well, there were no Jews. Abraham is revered by all three major world religions. 
Abraham is revered as the father of the Jews, but he's also revered as the father of the Arabs and the Muslims. And, of course, we as Christians, he is considered like the father of our faith. So Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all hold Abraham in very high esteem. And he is someone to be, uh, someone to be admired, and he, he is a great example. He, is, he was referred to as a friend of God, right? I think it was Abraham that was a friend of God. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Here's the whole thing about the Old Testament, the whole thing about the nation of Israel. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says this. And the Lord said to Abram, go out from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. In other words, he's going to call, he was going to call Abram out of everything that was familiar, all of the wealth and security. His family was fairly wealthy. And he came out and God said, if you'll follow me, I will make of you a great nation. and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those. Listen, this is very important. This is a promise, not only about, the, about Abraham, but the nation of Israel. Very important, you understand. This is on the descendants of Abraham. And God said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So uh, I was trying to research this, try to, you know, dial it in as to exactly when this happened. It probably happened almost 2,000 years before Jesus came. So we're talking about close to 4,000 years ago, God appeared to Abram, a man who was an idol worshiper. His father actually made idols, according to Jewish tradition and history. Terah was his, Abraham's father's name, and Terah was an idol maker. That's where he got a lot of his income. And so, but God chose this man. I don't know how God found Abram, but I mean, he, he's just like, he just, he's just so random. He just wasn't, wouldn't have been part of the picture as far as you and I would have been concerned. But 4,000 years ago, in what we probably know now as the Bronze Age, God found Abraham and told him to leave his own country and find a, a land that he was going to take him to. You see, the thing about a lot of the conflict with Israel right now, that land was promised to them by God. And Abraham went to take possession of that land 4,000 years ago. So, And we want, to always, we want to have a lot of compassion for those types of skirmishes. And I think we have to be very careful not to have an oversimplistic view of very complicated issues. And I think that's sort of what you have going on in the, in the Middle East right now. But God told Abraham two things. Number one, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you unbelievably. And the second thing in verse three said, I will bless those that bless you. It's for this reason. There's two reasons why we as Christians, and I just referenced this a minute ago. There's two reasons why as Christians, we just admire the Jewish people so much. First of all, they give us the Old Testament. Okay? They give us the Old Testament. Jesus was not a Baptist. Jesus was not a Pentecostal. Jesus was not a non-denominational. Jesus was not a Methodist. I mean, all these different classifications. Jesus wasn't even a Catholic. Jesus was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. So that's the reason why we have such admiration for, for that culture and for those people, because that's where we got our Savior from. Almost all of the New Testament writers, the only one I can think of right offhand that wasn't was Luke, but almost all the rest of them were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And it's out of that, that beautiful culture and out of that beautiful land that we hold dear. And, and we feel like we have such an affinity and such admiration and respect for them. And also the fact that if I bless them, God's going to bless me. And if I curse them, not going to be so good for me. They hold a special place for us. Now, let me just throw this out here. That doesn't mean that as a Christian, we necessarily have to agree with everything that that country does or everything that nation does. You know, people are people. I, I'm not going to, you know, I didn't do a deep dive in the war and all that stuff that's going on over there. I don't know all the issues. I can tell you that Jesus loves the Jewish people. God loves the Jewish people. I can also tell you that God loves the Palestinians. And we have a lot of Palestinian Christians that are over there that are suffering. And there are a lot of Palestinian Christians that love you a lot more than the Jews do. Because they think we're heretics. They think our religion is a false religion. And as much admiration. Uh, now, there's a great relationship between America and Israel. And there better be. Because that's one of the quickest ways for our country to go down the toilet, flush it, 
and close the lid is for us to turn our back on Israel. That is God's chosen people. That does not mean that everything they do is spot on and right. But uh, we should pray. The Bible says we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And if you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying for the peace of Jewish people, of Muslim people, of Arabs, because all those different groups are there in Jerusalem. And we're praying for all of them that somehow God will turn that situation around. But I do know this. There's going to be war in the last days. We'll talk about this in the next couple of weeks. There's going to be war in the last days. And this war is leading up to the biggest, the baddest war as Saddam Hussein. How many of you thought you would hear me quote Saddam Hussein this morning? The mother of all wars. You remember that when he said that? I hate to break this to him, but we smacked his mother around or something because that was not the mother of all wars. Battle of Armageddon. So, so there, listen, <laughs> it's going to be exciting times. Maybe roller coaster exciting, but there's going to be exciting times in these last days. The greatest sign of these end times, the end times, is, is Israel becoming a nation once again. Okay, people say, oh, what's the big deal? Israel's, Israel, okay, look, look at 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, okay? You have Israel, okay? Where are the Jewish people at? Well, we know where that. Well, they're scattered throughout the world, but they have their own country, all right? You say, you say God wasn't involved, this is no big deal. Where are the Philistines now? They existed at the time of the Jews. Where were where, where they? Amalekites. Where are the Jebusites? You know? Where are the Amorites? Where are the termites? I mean, where are all these groups of people that existed back then? But God, and here's, here's the amazing thing. There's a lot of prophecies. I just want to read, read one because you people are getting nervous and hunger pains are hitting your body. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 13 says this. This is a promise. Understand Israel had not been a nation for centuries when this was written. Okay. So basically, when Israel as a nation ceased to exist was in the year around 593, when you remember Nebuchadnezzar, and this is the whole story in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar raided, and, and Israel was actually, that was Judah, Israel, the, the northern kingdom, it got divided after Solomon's son tried to take part of the country, and then another one, it was, it was a hot mess. And so the northern kingdom, Israel, had been conquered 150 years earlier by the Assyrians, and then the southern kingdom of Judah Eventually, the year around 593, I think it was, was destroyed and taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And from that time, up until the time that Ezekiel made this prophecy, it had been a period of time. And then, hundreds of years until Israel returned to their homeland. But here's the prophecy that Israel gave. After the, the Israel's have been scattered, they're no longer a nation. He made this, pro, this prophecy, Ezekiel 34, 13. And I will bring them from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. That's a promise, that, that's a prophecy that God gave the nation of Israel through Ezekiel. And so that was almost 600 years before Christ. We're over 2,000 years since Christ. So it's been, it was over 2,000, around 2,000 years that Israel did not exist as a nation when all those other peoples fell by the wayside. And yet, in May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation again, was recognized by the United Nations. It's the greatest sign that we're living in the last days. What, is that, what does that mean for us? That means that you've got to be ready. Where's Yvonne? Yvonne is a Boy Scout. What's the motto of the Boy Scouts? She's a sponsor. She's not actually a Boy Scout. Be prepared, right? Be prepared. And that's what this all is about, is for us to be prepared and realize Jesus said, and this is my final point, Jesus said in, in Luke 21, he said, when the world sees all these signs happening in the last days, here's, I like the way the King James Version says it, when, when the world sees all these things happening in the last days, their hearts will fail them for fear for all these things that are taking place. The wars, the rumors of wars, all those things. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, when they, when their hearts are failing them for fear, I want you to look up and rejoice because your redemption is drawing nigh. He came the first time. He's going to come back a second time. Are you ready? Amen. Pray with me. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these signs that you give us. We thank you for your word, which is a lamp into our feet and a light into our pathway. Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning, God, that our hearts will be open and receptive 
to you. Amen. Before we pray anymore, somebody here this morning say, hey, I want you to pray with me. Amen. I'm trying to work on my relationship with Christ, and, and I just need a little prayer this morning. Maybe you've never asked him into your life, or, or maybe you're just sort of struggling right now, and, and, and maybe you just need to like, take that next step as far as surrender and commitment to him. Anyone want me to pray? Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Uh, that our hearts can be open and receptive to you. We just pray, Father, this morning that you would work in our lives to accomplish your perfect will. And Lord, I pray that each one of us, we struggle with getting off the throne of our life and allowing you to sit and rule and reign on the throne of our life and to be our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are coming back. And we thank you, Lord, that you're coming back for your church. And we're thankful we can be a part of your church because of what Jesus has done for us. Go with us as we leave this place. Help us to let our light shine in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. Count to ten and you may.